I was a bit surprised and, uh, of course, uh, grateful to get this opportunity. It's a first for me because it's the first time I actually have to do the same presentation twice on the same day. Uh, crazy. It's also the first time that I'm mic'd up twice. So I'm carrying lots of threads and this kind of so. But I hope this will go well. Okay. Thank you for being here. Let's get this started. I don't know. Uh, these might be the hardest words to say in any language. And we avoid saying them, of course, uh, scared of coming across as doubtful and uncertain. We'd rather be knowledgeable and certain, especially in a professional context where maybe our colleagues and our bosses want us to be firm, certain, even provide assurance. Does that sound familiar? Over the past years, I've grown increasingly uncomfortable with that. Uh, I ended up having a hard time being sure of anything anymore. I said to myself, all these years of experience and there's still so much that I don't know. And when I voiced my concerns on Twitter, as I sometimes do, a helpful American developer by the name of Brett Schuchert replied to me and said, get over the illusion of knowledge, be prepared to strongly defend weakly held beliefs. I kind of, was kind of surprised by that and didn't really get what it meant, but now it took a while before it resonated and sank in, but what he actually meant was, well, make good arguments for what you believe because this forces you to think things through, but at the same time, don't get too attached to them because this would undermine your ability to see or hear evidence that clashes with your conviction. You might have been wrong, but there's also nothing wrong with admitting that. And then someone else uh, weighed in and said, it sounds like you're rejecting certainty, like Socrates, that's uh, skepticism. You are a tester, you should embrace it. I think these wise words came from Michael Bolton. Um, I said, well, that's a great idea, but how does one embrace skepticism? Um, so I decided to try and find out. So this is my journey into skepticism that I want to share with you. I will share with you my adventures and my lessons learned and what I think can mean for testing. Um, but first, a little disclaimer, although I will be talking about science, I won't be quoting Albert Einstein, so there's that. You know it up front, and it's good. <laughs> so, my mission was clear a year and a half ago. I wanted to submerge myself in all things skeptic in hope of finding things to help me with my testing. Uh, but where to start? I figured it would be a good idea to uh, enroll with a skeptic organization in Belgium called SCEP but I soon became very skeptical of the way they spam their members with very confusing announcements and mails, and they promised magazines and that kind, they never appeared, that kind of stuff. I'm no longer a member. But still, they pointed me in good directions. Uh, I dove in uh, forums, books, articles. I watched documentaries and movies. Um, I went to lectures uh, with Richard Dawkins, that kind of stuff, Michael Shermer. Um, I attended events. Most of these were on critical thinking, skepticism, uh, philosophy, that kind of stuff. And after a while, it became clear that this was kind of one-sided. If I wanted to really have a clear view uh, and a good balanced view on things, I needed to familiarize myself with the other side as well, the favorite targets of skeptics nowadays, meaning pseudoscience and the paranormal, the rabbit hole. So, but I welcome this new twist in my quest. Since I, was, uh, since I was little, I was fascinated by the strange, the bizarre, and the mysterious. As a little kid, 10 year old, I looked up to my older brother, who was into things like uh, hypnosis, uh, ghosts, extrasensory perception, that kind of stuff. He had these magazines and books laying around in his room, which I sneaked in and, and I looked at all these ghost pictures. He also had um, these eerie voice recordings, electronic voice phenomena, also called voices from the dead. And they really freaked me out. At that age, I, I couldn't get to sleep anymore because of that. Later on, this kind of fear made way for fascination. And I started collecting weird magazines like the Weekly World News. Uh, and I dreamt of, fantasized of being a copywriter for them because I liked their, their headlines so much. Huh? Uh, horse born with a human face, it smiles when you give it an apple. Great. Uh, okay, but I never dug deeper since then, until now. And this is where things got, uh, well, interesting. Uh, with uh, the mind of a skeptic, but the heart of a believer, because mind of a skeptic, because of all the theory behind my belt in the meantime, I jumped into the rabbit hole. I took my time to familiarize myself with lots of strange phenomena. You see a couple of them here. Um, and as a tester, I wanted to test all the claims that I encountered. But the sheer volume of them that I encountered there, and 
to be honest, the absurdity and silliness of some of them made it a mission impossible. A little illustration. Did you say again that this is a post? Yes, I did say it because I wanted to be sure that somebody else was seeing it. Now this one, can you see that? Satan lives up. Just terrible. Is the dumpster still possessed? I, I, was, we still had trouble off and on with it, yes. can't argue with that. Eh? <laughs> Satan is despicable, but he does make a mean toast. <laughs> um, OK. A little anecdote. Uh, last year, I was in Portland, Oregon, United States, the city of weird, US capital of weird. Their proud tagline is, keep Portland weird, my kind of city. And I figured the place to do a midnight ghost hunting tour. Booked a ticket. And before the tour started, I started talking to, this, uh, to the guide, Sally. And she said she was a skeptic. She said, that's why we're going, we are going to use real scientific equipment on the tour, EMF meters. You can see it there. Um, so we went uh, on the tour, ghost hunting, armed with these EMF meters, looking for ghosts on known haunted locations. And it was a fun, but not very spooky experience, because Sally sounded like she was reciting lines from a script, and she nearly fainted every time these EMF meters were flashing. Uh, so I ended the night with fond memories, it was fun, but with a lot of underexposed pictures. No any ghosts in there, didn't see them. So just as using a calculator doesn't make you a mathematician, using a scientific instrument like the EMF meter, it doesn't make you a scientist. And in a similar vein, using a test management tool, it doesn't make you a test manager at all. First reference to testing. But it's little experiments like this, uh, being skeptical, thinking about it, uh, looking up sources, that kind of stuff, being, uh, while doing your research, it can help you filter between interesting and forgettable. So I learned to do that. And after a while, the more time I spent with the, the, the bizarre and the, the mysterious, the more I felt my skeptic muscles aching. Do you know that pain, that muscle pain that you have when you uh, practice a sport that you're not really familiar with, the kind of, the pain that reminds you of muscle groups you didn't even know you had. The same thing was happening to me. My believer brains were hurting at first. This is so cool, I want all this stuff to be true. Uh, and, but after a while, skeptic mode seemed to have become the default. So it was as if the wiring in my brain was, was kind of changing. So that's, uh, I was asking myself, how does it come? How did it happen? So maybe it's time to look at, have a short look at what skepticism actually is. The theory, short part. Skepticism has a long tradition dating back to ancient Greece uh, with uh, Pyrrhonism, the most known flavor of that. It's, it was named after the Greek philosopher Pyrrho of Elis, who is considered the, the founder of uh, skepticism. And Pyrrhonism is a position that refrains from making truth claims. They uh, recommend suspending belief. They say, well, our senses are easily fooled and reason follows easily our desires. We cannot be even sure of our own senses. And this is not always a practical position to take. Uh, modern skepticism, scientific skepticism, has a, a different, slightly different approach to that. It's embodied in the scientific method. And I'll explain that a little bit later on. It originated from empiricism, which says that our true knowledge comes from sensory experience, experiencing the world around us, seeing stuff. So you can see that it's different from the previous uh, thing. They say that skepticism is about evaluating all claims with an open mind but uh, while well, insisting on persuasive evidence before accepting things. Skepticism is a method leading to provisional conclusions. Nothing is really sure. To summarize, you could say that skepti skepticism encourages you to um, reject certainty and question everything, but not to keep on questioning just for the hell of it. When some, some questions do have answers. When a question is answered in science, for instance, it's answered. You don't keep asking until maybe new elements pop up, new evidence of something. Then it might be appropriate to have another look. That's how science works. And this was illustrated uh, nicely in a, in a recent debate between um, a creationist, Ken Ham, 
and Bill Nye, also known as the science guy, scientist, and they were asked about evolution. What would change your mind on evolution, if anything? And Ken Ham said, nothing. Uh, it's in the scriptures. And Bill Nye said, well, give me one single shred of evidence and I'll gladly reconsider what I think about it. So that's the difference between the two. Also, people have argued that skepticism and scientific thinking is kind of dull and boring because it takes away all the wonder and excitement. But I don't think so, and this is a little fragment of Bill, uh, Richard Feynman on this uh, topic. I have a friend who sometimes you, which I agree with very well. The whole of the flower, I have to say, look how beautiful it is. Feynman has a way of saying these things. Yeah, this comes from an interview series called The Pleasure of Finding Things Out, and a nice animation I found. Uh, very interesting. So having a scientific mindset, it doesn't subtract from your experience, it only adds. Um, it's not one or the other. You can have a wild imagination and still be a good skeptic. Also, people see skeptics uh, often as cynics, grumpy curmudgeons, doubting Thomases that uh, are never open to new stuff or new ideas, but skeptics are open to new ideas, but they just need, they want to base themselves, their conclusions, on the best available evidence and arguments. That's what skepticism is all about. Now over to skeptical toolkit. What's in the skeptical toolkit? You can see skepticism as a science in action, personalized and modified for everyday use. But how does one think like a scientist? If you are not a scientist, how do you do that? This tweet from Neil deGrasse Tyson, American astrophysicist, gives away some clues here. He says you can train your mind how to think better. You can train your mind on how not to become fooled. And the good news is, we are all already halfway there. We are all using critical thinking and skepticism, whether you realize it or not, every day. And maybe an interesting experiment here. I have something really special I want to share with you. If I told you that this apple, eating this apple would make you 25% smarter, would you buy it from me? It's already bitten, by the way, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> it's only 10, uh, 10 euros, let's say. It of course it works, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't present. Do you believe me? I'm on a stage. <laughs> it works, really, I, I bit it and I became, I, I can do it again, I can. Mm. Yeah, insights. <laughs> Crazy, okay. I regretted doing this in the first presentation. I instantly regret it now. <laughs> we have some time, eh? Okay. About, about the scientific method. Well, there was one big constant in all the skeptic literature I was reading. All of them stressed the importance of the scientific method. So I was curious and went looking for that a little bit. And it consists of the following steps, roughly. I made this based on other stuff. It's a simplification. Uh, but, okay, observe. Look and listen with deliberate efforts. Ask questions, and that's critical. Don't just passively accept what you're told. Then do your own research, do your own fact-checking. Then form a hypothesis, and then do some experiments, some tests to check your hypotheses. Then analyze the result of that. And depending on the outcome, either start over, think of new hypotheses, or move on if you're satisfied. Moving on would mean sharing your results with others. Um, this is a great way to, to get feedback from people who might know more about this than you do. That's how science also works. People discuss stuff, discuss their findings. 
Carl Sagan, in his book, Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, shares his own set of practical thinking heuristics called the Bologna Detection Kit. The bullshit detection kit, if you pardon my English. Um, other skeptics have shared their rules of thumb as well and some advice as well, and this is kind of a short list that I assembled from a couple of them. So this is not only from Carl Sagan, and I'll run you through a couple of them. First one is Occam's razor. When you're confronted with two hypotheses that explain something equally well, go with the simpler. A little example, maybe a little simple example, it's maybe, but still, okay. It disappeared on my toast this morning. Well, that is the most logical and simple explanation that Shmuel Gershon appeared on my toast during breakfast, which is entirely possible. Um, or I used a website called photofunia.com to generate this picture, right? We put up a poll in, in Google in the, in that. Okay, back, the backfire effect is something, um, people get really attached to a hypothesis just because it's theirs. Um, I would say try not to do that. A hypothesis is only a way station in your pursuit of knowledge. Um, try to look at it from a distance and see and compare it fairly with alternatives. Beware of arguments from authority. Uh, people that say, I know I am right because I'm the expert, I'm a, an expert. Experts have made mistakes in the past and they will do so in the future as well. They carry little weight like that. Ask yourself, what if I'm wrong whenever you're confronted, whenever, whenever you have to make important assumptions? Um, considering both sides will uh, uh, leave you with an exit route if your information turns out to be false, so you're not as surprised. Also know the unknowns. Try to figure out all the unknowns on your situation or project. Of course, it's impossible to, well, know all the variables and the missing variables, but being aware of them will help you react quickly uh, when new information arrives. Also try to falsify hypotheses, find ways in which to falsify. Propositions that are not falsifiable or untestable aren't worth much. Remember that in testing, you only need one test to prove that something is not working, while 100 passing tests, they don't necessarily guarantee you anything. Cut the arrogance that sometimes comes with certainty. Certainty, I will say so, uh, explain later, is a tricky thing. Beware of ultra-crepidarianism. Ever heard of that? I took it from uh, the book, uh, Think Like a Freak. Uh, it's a habit of giving opinions and advice on matters outside your competence. And it's a phenomenon that goes on uh, quite a lot nowadays. Well, um, don't need to do that. Also be aware of something called the law of truly large numbers. The law of truly, truly large numbers says that um, with a large enough sample, any odd coincidence is likely to happen. A lot of very strange uh, coincidences can be explained by simple math. For instance, if you have a group of 23 people, the chance that two of them share the same birthday is more than half, it's 51%. So, although the math is not really simple in that case, you need to know a little bit of pr probability theory and that kind of stuff, but still, it can be explained. Uh, and this is also something that comes up a lot when debunking pseudoscience or the paranormal. Uh, for instance, when psychics do predictions, the more predictions a psychic makes, the higher the probability that one prediction will come true. And when that happens, usually people forget all the predictions that didn't come true. So that's also going on. Okay, so you've seen a little bit of the, tool the toolkit. Now the practice, what should we be skeptical of? Well, it's always good to start with ourselves, right? And no matter how good your intentions, sometimes things happen that, well, shake the very foundations of your skepticism. Last year, I was driving in a, in a tunnel, a six kilometer long tunnel late at night, my car on my own, and I was driving the speed limit, and there was no other cars in the tunnel, and all of a sudden, I see a car approaching my rear view mirror, and it was approaching, so I was kind of surprised because I was driving the limit, but still. And I expected it to overtake me anytime soon, so I looked in front again, and it never passed me by. And I was wondering what happened. I was looking behind, nothing, in front, nothing. There were no exits in the, in the tunnel. Um, I was wide awake. Uh, I was sober as well. It's important to know. And I, did I just see a ghost car? And then I thought of Occam's razor. What is the most likely explanation that I saw a ghost car, which is the 21st century kind of version of the Headless Horseman? Or did, I, did my vision and my memory play tricks on me? So far, evidence 
points to the latter. There's plenty of scientific evidence, experiments that have been done that show that we can trust our eyes, we can trust our ears, and we can trust our memories. Now I'm coming on Alice Keogh's terrain as well. She mentioned a couple of these things as well. Our brain is a belief engine. From the moment sensory data comes in, our brain starts looking for patterns. It starts finding these patterns and then infuses those patterns with meaning. And our tendency, people have that tendency to spot uh, meaning in meaningless noise is also called patternicity. These patterns then become beliefs and then our brain goes looking for evidence in support of those beliefs. So it becomes kind of a confirmation loop that confirms all the things we already believe. It's kind of tricky. That's why we see, well, our observation is, is fallible. We don't really see the things that we look at. The patterns that our, brains wa that our brain wants to see aren't always there. That's why we see faces in things, a phenomenon called pareidolia. That's why we see faces in windows. That's why we see Donald Trump in our buttercup. That's why we see UFOs and ghosts in fuzzy, underexposed pictures. That's why we see Jesus in family pictures. You spot him? Yeah. Here is a better look. Of course, when Jesus is a family member, he can might as well appear in your family picture legitimately. So, um, you saw that picture at the keynote. Faces on Mars. You see anything here? Grandma Caterpillar putting on lipstick. I'll move out of the way. <laughs> so, okay. I also want to do a little experiment here, um, just to prove the point a little bit. Uh, I want you to look at the center of the screen, focus on the center of the screen, and don't look at the faces on the sides yet. Just try to focus on the cross in the middle, and these faces are going to, yeah, okay, start looking at the cross. Keep looking at the cross. By now, you might notice that these faces may look a bit, little strange. Do you see that? Kind of distorted, uh, pale, big eyes. Look back at them, now normally. See them change? Do you see anything? This is called the flashed face, face distortion effect. What's happening is that the previous image is distorting the next one. And this is, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting, it just happens to you. And if you remember, you can, you can go home and say, I remember these faces were distorted, but actually they weren't. This is kind of a neat visual illusion that kind of illustrates the point that you're easily getting fooled with. This goes on for a while. Um, we see patterns in data as well. When the numbers line up, our brains try to do everything to find reasons behind the connection. And although the data may be correlated, it doesn't, it doesn't prove causation. So this graph is definite proof that the Jim Carrey movies cause autism. You see, it is highly correlated. And this is, of course, very silly because it might as well be Jim Carrey movies that cause, uh, autism that cause Jim Carrey movies. That's, <laughs> huh? That's what I thought. Okay. These are visual things that happen to us. The same happens with audio. We get fooled by auditory illusions just the same. Um, there's a great website called reversespeech.com where you can download samples of supposedly hidden messages in music when you play it backwards. A lot of rock music contains messages. Uh, I'm just gonna, one of the most known examples is Stairway to Heaven from Led Zeppelin. I'm just gonna play a little fragment backwards and see if you can spot the, the messages that are in there, supposedly. I don't hear it. <laughs> might, might be, might be. I heard Satan. Satan? Could be. Let's, let's listen again. But now I will, I'll prime your, the auditory part of your brain to tell you what you will hear. of a tool 
Shit where Satan made you suffer. Oh. <laughs> now the thing is, you cannot. Once you hear this, you cannot unhear it anymore. Eh? It's it's there. Oh. <laughs> I mentioned this is probably the only uh, talk that mentions Satan three times. In the... <laughs> um, now I lost my. <laughs> okay. There's another funny um, auditory illusion called the Rhymer's Reason Effect, also known as the Eaton Rosen phenomenon. Apparently, things, statements that are put on rhyme are perceived as being more truthful. Uh, there was a good example of that was in the O.J. Simpson trial, when the defense was using the phrase, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. And they kept repeating that, and people started believing that. So I think this can help you as a tester as well. Eh? If James agrees, we can release. <laughs> I'm telling thee it's all back free. And I used the phrase in the previous presentation, uh, I must state this presentation's great and it worked. <laughs> huh? Ah, okay. Uh, okay. The same thing happens with memories. Um, our memories are, this can be distorted because they're plastic and malleable. Uh, it's not a capture and replay device. Our brains, what our brains do, they tell us a story about what happens and it fills in the gaps for us. And it, this is often, more often than not, this is a great help for us. We don't need to remember all the things in, in all the de little details. But sometimes it gets us into trouble as well. When people ask you, well, are you really sure that you tested that part? And you say, sure, yeah, of course, I tested that part. But do you really remember all the screens you went in, all the dialogues you clicked, all the mouse movements you made, the little, all the little uh, corners that you visited of the application? Unless you have had, you've taken recordings or taken some notes, there's no way to be really, really sure of that. So knowing all this, that we, our senses are so easily fooled, it's uh, obvious that we should be skeptical, not only of ourselves, but also of, of certainty. And here's a little experiment, another one. You're my guinea pigs for this. This is a little fragment of text that I would like you to read, not out loud, but just inside of your head. Does this make sense? Is it comprehensible or meaningless? Your mind is sorting through all different explanations now. Look, uh, look what happens when I uh, present you with one word. If you now reread the same text, something strange happens. The previous discomfort is shifting into a pleasing sense of rightness. Uh, all of a sudden, the paragraph has been infused with the, the feeling of knowing. You know it's about a kite, right? It's a very peculiar feeling, actually, the first time I, I read this. But, twist, what if I tell you this is actually just a collection of fortune cookie quotes? <laughs> ah! Your mind struggles because when this, the presence of the feeling of knowing makes contemplating alternatives difficult. That's how certainty works in, a, in that strange way. I got this for all from a book by Robert Burton. Uh, on being certain, believing you're right even when you're not. And he, he investigated the feeling of certainty. And he found out something really, really important. Well, the, the one thing that I found the most important from the whole book was that despite how certain he feels, it's not a conscious choice, nor even a thought process. It arises out of brain mechanisms that, like love or anger, function independently of reason. And for me, this has important, very important implications. I think we ultimately cannot be sure when we think we know something to be true. Knowing this, and here's my sequence going on, maybe sometimes we should just admit that we don't know something for sure. And it's quite hard because people have been struggling with admitting ignorance since ancient times. In the Middle Ages, people put sea serpents and dragons on maps to cover the unknown areas, the unexplored areas. Here be dragons, here be lions. Um, they did that because yeah, the unknown was frightening and it felt a bit reassuring and safe to, to label the unknown with a very satisfying label. Um, and people are still doing that nowadays. 
whenever you're confronted with something where you don't have a, you don't have a rational explanation for a phenomenon, it's easy to, uh, well, go to the, the best paranormal explanation that's available. Well, yeah, it's more complex to think of all the, the complexity of cognitive phenomena like the, the law of large numbers or that kind of stuff. Also, I see uh, here be dragons and labels also in testing. For instance, if we label testing as something like a pass-fail activity, and we label it for our comfort, and we ignore all the, the very ingenious thinking and, and uh, activities that go on in there. I've seen that happen as well in our industry. Our quest for knowledge and understanding is a daunting one, right? The more we know, the more we become aware of what we don't know, and all of a sudden we feel like we don't know anything at all anymore. And this was also summarized by uh, Socrates in his famous saying, all I know is that I know nothing. And this graph, it's not a serious graph, and don't, it's said on the side, it's, please note, it's a joke. Uh, it's not scientific, but it illustrates the point a little bit. Uh, there's three phases. In the beginning, humility and ignorance go hand in hand. You're a beginner, you don't know much, and you're aware of that. And then there's phase two. It's called hazard here, the most interesting phase. You know some things, and all of a sudden you think you're the world's greatest expert. And then there's phase three. You're an expert, or you know a lot of things, but just because of that you know you're only scratching the surface. So I see a lot of I know nothing, I don't know here. And this was a sentiment that started this whole journey. Maybe I'll ponder on the, the total stuff here. Um, bottom, top left, I don't know. Does it mean we're back to square one? It might look like it, but I don't think so, because my initial worry that I had now feels more like a, a, some kind of reassurance, because I noticed that there's plenty of knowledgeable people that I look up to, that, that know they are very experts in their field, who have no problem at all saying that they don't know something. Next is a fragment of economist and Nobel Prize winner Thomas Sargent, who appeared in an ad only saying only this. kind of brave of him to do that. He's the authority, but still he knows that he doesn't know that. People should do that more often. Also Richard Feynman, also pleasure of finding things out. Here's a little fragment that, where he talks about not knowing things. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers not be wrong. I have approximate answers, I have possible beliefs, and different degrees of certainty about different things, but not to be sure of anything. And there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything they ask, why we behave. And what the question might mean, I might think about it a little better, I can't figure it out, then I'll go to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't have, I don't feel frightened by not knowing anything. By being lost in a mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is still able to be as far as I can tell us, it doesn't fight me. The whole series uh, is from the BBC. It's available. You can see it on YouTube. It's really interesting. Uh, but one thing is apparent here: that scientists have no problem whatsoever saying that they don't know something. And it's striking, but it's also logical because for scientists saying I don't know doesn't feel uncomfortable, it's, it's a routine. Because in science, until you can admit what you don't yet know, there's no way to, to learn what you need to. Uh, they say that yeah, you need um, ignorance to advance to more knowledge. You have to know what you have to learn. Okay, so now for the one million, million dollar question, what can skepticism and doubt bring to the testing table? I think there's a couple of things. Let me point them out. The scientific method encourages us to question and to do our own research. These are things that we can do in almost any phase of the development cycle. For instance, 
I think that testing is a questioning business rather than an answering business. We ask the questions first and then question the answers. And this is not my uh, saying. I, I borrowed it from Fiona Charles, but maybe she got it from somewhere else. I don't really know, but I liked it. Uh, we uncover information that would otherwise remain hidden. We try to do that. We fact-check things to clarify hidden assumptions and also to manage expectations with the rest of the team. We critically examine information, then go looking for what's missing. And this is quite important because the information that we need is often scattered, incomplete, or even not known by anyone on the project. And to cover this knowledge gap and to dig deeper, there's uh, loads of context-free questions that we can ask whenever, the, regardless of the project or situation we're in. This is a list of context-free questions I took from a book uh, by Jerry Weinberg, Exploring Requirements. There's three types here, process questions, product questions, and meta questions, questions about your questions. But you can maybe come up with your own. And also, I think Michael Bolton has a, a blog post in which he outlines things, a whole list of questions that you can ask when you arrive somewhere um, to make sense of your situation, to position yourself. Also, skeptics encourage us to reject certainty and suspend our judgment until we, we've been able to do some fact-checking ourselves. This is also something very powerful, I think, that we can do on an almost daily basis. I would say never assume that you've been told is the whole truth, or even correct. And I'm not trying to make you paranoid here. I'm not saying that people are flat out lying to you, but people probably don't even know the whole truth. They're telling you the truth as they, as they see it. And this is an important lesson, and I could have used this myself when our developers were telling the team, the rest of the team, well, you don't need to test that part of the application. We only did a small fix here. We don't have much time, so if you focus on that, we'll be fine. We went with their judgment, only to find out later that whole parts of the application weren't working anymore. So can you be really, really sure if you change something that it won't be affected? We are the ones that kind of have to be skeptical about that. Also, never accept as a fact anything you haven't been able to question or at least verify. Um, for instance, one of my previous projects, there was this common truth or accepted fact that test managers weren't allowed to test. I arrived there as a new test manager, and I said, yeah, it's, it's part of the working instructions. Uh, we need to leave that to the offshore testers uh, in India. Uh, instructions from our one, uh, N plus one from our line manager. I said, okay. Uh, but for this particular thing that needed to be tested, it was kind of counterproductive because they, the people in India didn't know uh, the feature that was going to that was going to be tested. They also didn't know the setup, the co very complex technical setup that I had just created. So I went to the project manager, not to the line manager, different reporting line, and I asked him, "Would you be okay with me doing it? A small a couple of small sessions just to see that I tested." And he was kind of surprised, but then he said, "Okay, go ahead." So I did it find a couple of things, we were able to move quite quickly. Later on, the, the line manager was quite, well, he wasn't really mad, but he was kind of yeah, not too happy. But the project manager thanked me uh, because of my flexibility, and I think that because of my questioning the fact that the project was a little bit better off than that. Also be skeptical of what the majority believes. Okay. As a tester, well, testers should maintain uncertainty when all around us are pretty sure about everything. For instance, everyone in the team might be convinced, okay, this is working well enough, let's ship. Maybe what we should do is suspend our judgment until we've been able to do everything in our possibility to disprove that it works. About not knowing, well, I mentioned before that uh, certainty is a strange thing. It's a lot like love or anger. Well, the moment we think we know something, our mind goes in autopilot mode. We stop thinking critically about it. Um, and this has fooled me many times in my career, more than I care to admit. Um, I thought I knew how our customers worked, mainly hospital personnel. I visited a customer in the past. Uh, one single sobering side visit cured me from that illusion. It turned out we had been testing with the wrong focus all along. Um, knowing how one customer works is no guarantee to know it for the rest of them. In this case, um, taking your testing out in the field is a good cure for that. Also, when you arrive new on a project, uh, it's kind of daunting. You, there's a lot of information to, to wrap your head around, uh, lots of things you need to pick up. But people know you're new. They don't expect you to know everything from the start. And other people, mainly consultants, would probably say, okay, fake it till you make it. 
and I've seen it work, and I've done it in the, in the past myself a couple of times, and it has worked, but I, I now no longer choose to do that. I don't want to pretend anymore. My default stance is now to say I don't know yet, and I suspend my judgment until I understand things better. And I encourage you to do the same. It's okay to not know everything. It's okay to say I don't know or I don't understand yet. It's okay to ask for more clarity or help. It's okay to challenge the things that you're not comfortable with. It's okay, well, to ask what acronyms stand for. And I don't know if you've been in a situation that you're in an early meeting, uh, terms are flying around that you don't know, acronyms, and you don't ask what they mean. And from that point on, all the people assume that you know what they mean and they start arresting you about the terms that you don't know what. Uh, I call this the silent lie spiral. So you get in your own little lie that you pretend. Uh, it works if you immediately say, okay, I don't know what that is. Can you explain it to me? It works wonders for me. Last thing, um, lesson 40 in the book, Lessons Learned in Software Testing says, you're harder to fool if you know you're a fool. Our senses and the behavior of software can fool us. That's why we have to use our skeptical force, knowing that we are easy to fool. This keeps us on our toes and forces our mind to think harder. For instance, we could use that um, force when we're confronted with graphs, charts, or statistics. Ask yourself, what do they mean? What do they show? Maybe more important, what don't they show? Graphs are often used to uh, help interpret data, but often they do just the opposite. They distort the data. And it becomes a problem for us testers, I think, when test strategies are based on decisions that are based on these graphs and charts. Then we become into, then we come into tricky terrain. Also, there's a way to infuse a little uncertainty and a, a bit of reasonable doubt in your daily practice using safety language. When you say things like, I, I'm sure or I know this is the behavior, you better be right or your credibility is on the line there. Maybe it's best to sometimes say it appears, it seems, so far. Kind of, that's kind of language that uh, inserts some uh, uncertainty. Also, my adventures with the paranormal has ta have taught me to distinguish observation from inference. Observation is the careful watching of things, gathering data, and inference is drawing conclusions based on that data. And it gets tricky because inferences are based on our beliefs and our assumptions. And it gets tricky when we fail to distinguish between what we actually saw happen and things we only inferred. And there's a good tool I find that, that's helpful for that, and that's asking the data question. What did I see or hear or smell or feel or taste that led me to this conclusion? And this, this simple question can help you a lot in seeing, okay, this is only an assumption. This is not based on real observed things. Okay, so to conclude, I think doubt has kind of a doubtful reputation. It doesn't seem to get you very far in this day and age. Um, it doesn't win you prizes. It doesn't get you promoted. Uh, but I've seen doubt correlate with, with wisdom and knowledge and skill as well. So that kept me wondering, isn't it time for a revaluation of doubt? Shouldn't we be viewing doubt not as a weakness but as a sign of competence and cultural baggage? I think doubting reasonably can make us better testers. The key to skepticism is to continuously and ferociously apply the methods of science. And the hardest in that is to actually find a balance, as Carl Sagan said, between two seemingly contradictory mindsets. At one side, constant scrutiny and open, constant openness to new ideas, and on the other side, constant skeptical scrutiny of all ideas, old and new, and find a balance between that. So I would say doubt, as final words, doubt but doubt reasonably. Question everything, including yourself. Think, above all, please, think. But don't lose your sense of wonder. And since every movement needs a manifesto, I present you with a skeptic manifesto. So a while ago I chose to embrace the skeptic lifestyle. This has taught me to value suspending belief, rejecting certainty over being convinced finding things out over believing what you're told, challenging claims over accepting them, saying I don't know yet over pretending to know, deciding based on best available evidence over sticking what you know is right, and questions that can be answered over answers that can be questioned. And uh, similarity with other existing 
Manifestos is, of course, totally coincidental. <laughs> Thank you.